Okay. Um, well, you'll see a few uh, familiar uh, figures because these these failure or these discussions all tie together. Um, so some of the key concepts I'll cover are um, the hydraulics and geology in the uh, spillway foundation. Um, and how those contribute to the potential to initiate erosion, how the duration and the flow in the spillway affect um, the potential for spillway erosion, and how uniform versus complex ground conditions and geology might affect how a spillway erodes. And we'll talk a little bit about Oroville because it's a really re a great example, recent example, but Dana's gonna talk a little bit more about that in his presentation. Um, but spillway erosion is also linked to other potential failure modes, slope stability failure modes, shoot failure modes like Dana will talk about, um, as well as um, failure modes pertaining to uh, spillway walls and um, ceiling basins. So this is a hilarious photo to um, show that spillways in the past have taken a back seat a little bit. Um, but recently they've become a significant area of attention uh, due in large part to the Oroville uh, incident um, in 2017. So <clears throat> along with this, with state and fed other federal agencies, uh, the Corps has developed, is developing methodology and implementing a spillway screening evaluation for our entire inventory in order to identify potential vulnerable structures that need advanced risk, risk assessment based on some of the things that we learned from Oroville. Um, generally, spillways are um, expected to operate and function as intended um, during extreme hydraulic loading events and erosion during spillway discharges can, can threaten the stability of the dam and impact operations as we saw in Oroville. Um, <clears throat> but other things to think about are, are like, Oroville is a great example. It was really dramatic and how the incident was handled impacted how the public perceived um, various agencies. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a, a uh, a big, a big deal, a, bit, a front page, literally, um, issue to deal with. Um, repair costs can be high. Operational costs and operational um, impacts can be large. Uh, and things like pool restrictions are high profile, um, high profile things that the public uh, is is interested in and is directly impacted by. Um, but one interesting thing about spillways that, we, that people don't always think about is that failures uh, can often occur at flows that are much lower than the design flow for in a spillway. Um, so again, they're expected to operate as intended during spill events. Um, when we see issues that are occurring during a spill event, they can be hard to address in real time. So just in a quick uh, ero uh, overview of the spillway erosion process. Um, we're gonna focus on unlined spillways uh, in this presentation. Dana will talk about uh, lined chute spillways in his next presentation. Um, lined spillways are typically concrete in the spillway section. Um, so in order for erosion to happen, uh, has to happen through the lining, the lining has to fail and then scour. Um, the underlying rock or soil. For, for unlined spillway sections, we're directly scouring the rock um, in, into the foundation materials. So this is a tie back to what you saw from Adam in D1, um, looking at the various me mechanisms for scour and erosion um, and back rollers. Um, so just remember what Adam taught you. Um, stream power is an indicator of the erosive capacity of the flow, especially in turbulent areas um, where we can develop head cuts and plunge pools um, with high, high velocity flow over irregularities. And we'll look at a case study that shows that pretty well. Um, so there are methods like we talked about to predict the applied stream power given uh, the flow characteristics, and we can talk, we can think about the detachment mechanism. Um, again, we talked about that the other day, so I won't recover that. Um, but we'll see some case studies where we see uh, what the erosion in spillways look like. Um, also, uh, 
we can think about armoring um, and engineered uh, sills or other control stru structures that can keep erosion from progressing in a spillway. Um, but or also think about um, features in the spillway that might encourage erosion, like nick points that focus flow. Um, and, uh, and again, the tools that we talked about previously, wind dam um, and such, uh, to think about the erosive capacity or the erosive um, nature of the geology. So again, more of particle transport and detachment. So let's talk about a couple of um, spillway case histories. This is Rico Bio Dam. Um, spillway and dam were completed in 1933. It's a 320-foot tall arch dam um, with a 1,300-foot long unlined spillway channel. Um, the spillway channel was up open jointed granite with a fault fold structure located along the chute alignment, which impacted how um, how the erosion occurred. So um, the spillway was completed in 1933, and after that, there were five major scour events between 1934 and 1939. So four of them are shown here. The fifth one um, ha didn't have quite as much impact, so we're not talking too much about that one. But the slides um, show the, the erosion initiation, um, downcutting and upstream migration at flows that are substantially below the discharge to capacity, which is 4,000 cubic meters per second. So we get initiation at 100 meters per second, uh, cubic meters per second in 1934, and then we see um, at flows still substantially below the design discharge that we're getting um, progressive downcutting with, with various uh, continuing or con continued events. So um, this figure illustrates um, the mechanism for that erosion. So in this bottom figure, we're looking at the orientation of the joint set. So this is that fold structure uh, that occurs uh, about halfway down the chute, and the jointing um, orientation changes there, and that impacted how the erosion progressed. So what we're seeing in the top figure are these numbers, so one, two, three, four, and five are the various spill events um, and the um, shape of the shaded area shows the, the, what was eroded in those particular flow events. So what we're seeing is in flow event one, we were getting um, removal of blocks in this way. So the joints are um, going with the flow, so we're seeing um, the detachment removing joint, uh, the material in that pattern. Um, and the same with, with uh, flow event two and three, we're seeing that uh, migration up the spillway chute along these, this jointing set. But when we get to events four and five, the jointing pattern in the rock helped, um, helped to resist uh, the, the, against the flow. So the, the uh, migration kind of stopped where the jointing um, changed. So that's an indicator of how the geology um, impacts the evolution of, of spillway erosion. Um, so we got to think hard about what the, the, the geology is doing in, in terms of thinking about how far our erosion is going to progress. So this is the shape, uh, the, entire, the shape of the entire um, erosive feature after the five flow events. So this is what Rico Bio Dam looks like now. Uh, the current configuration is basically a concrete shoot, concrete, concrete, concrete was the way they solved this. Um, and the spillway has operated with floods in excess of those five major events that led to erosion prior to 1933. Um, so since then, since this repair, there hasn't been um, any additional damage. So the next um, case history we'll talk about is Sailorville Lake, which is located on the Des Moines River about 12 miles north of the city of Des Moines in Iowa, which is a large metropolitan area. Um, and, and this dam was designed um, with an emergency spillway. 
Um, as a result of design changes and a resultant loss of reservoir capacity, the spillway services, services now as a service spillway with frequent use of operation of about 20, once every 25 years. So the first spill event occurred in 1984 with a flow of um, about 17,000 cubic feet uh, per second with a depth of flow over the spillway of 5.3 feet. Um, the flow event lasted for about 14 days and head cutting and erosion progressed at the rate uh, previously calculated. However, since the expected frequency of use had changed significantly from the original design because of the change from a emergency spillway to a service spillway, um, the, a detailed review of the bedrock profile was undertaken to determine the stability of the concrete weir. Uh, if head cutting were to continue at the present and predicted rate during flow events. It was found that a questionable layer of shale existed 13 be three feet below the spillway. Uh, so a number of flood events were routed through the, <clears throat> the lower concrete apron um, and they determined that a stability problem could be expected if erosion were to continue. So this dam is classified as a high hazard dam and it was concluded that failure of um, of the spillway would be unacceptable. So a number of alternatives were investigated to reduce the amount of head cutting and reduce the risk of failure. Um, and a plan was selected with a series of rock anchors spaced throughout uh, a selected reach of the spillway channel to anchor the cap rock to the existing bedrock. Uh, and a concrete cutoff was constructed at the end of the concrete apron. Um, keying into a uh, highly erosion resistant siltstone to present undercutting. So we'll talk a little bit about those defensive measures like, a, a key, like keying in um, and anchoring. Um, so with those, repair, with those uh, considerations, the second event happened in 1991 with a flow of 16,000 cubic feet per second with a depth of flow over the spillway crest of five feet. And that amount of head cutting during that, that event in 1991 was less than experienced in 1984, but within um, the predictable limits. So what we're seeing at, seeing at this location is um, erosion downstream of the dam in that looks like this. So the erosive area is shown here and shown here. And this is what the material looked like. So all of those words I just said were, were, uh, were um, to describe that when flow comes, comes over um, that spillway, when it's used as a service spillway, we were getting uh, exposure of the, this bedding material or this this uh, foundation material that's bedded in this way with some er, some less erosive um, siltstone layers and uh, more erosive layers interbedded. So this is the um, what the erosion uh, in this spillway looked like. So you remember this cartoon of the the back rollers over a. a a less erosive material. So that's what we were seeing here is that the siltstone was serving as uh, this sort of cap rock and the flow would go over the, the siltstone and erode the shale in this, these back roller conditions, progressing all the way back up um, the spillway chute. So very much controlled by, by the geology. So thinking about those two um, Case histories, let's think about how we build an event tree for, spill, for uh, spillway erosion. So node one is the loading. Um, so we get spillway flow at some point, um, at some storage volume depth and duration over, um, over the dam. And then we get initiation. So we've talked about the factors that contribute to initiation, the capacity um, of the flow to erode, the how, the, how the material detaches, um, how flow might concentrate in a 3D perspective, whether there are any drops in the channels that might um, contribute to uh, how the flow regime affects erosion, nick points, um, and then also geologic um, shear or weak areas in the spillway chute that might um, erode or, or start places where the erosion could initiate. Then we talk about progression. 
um, you know, what are the factors that are contributing to um, the, once the erosion initiates, how it progresses upstream and how quickly it pro progresses upstream and whether there are any, um, any features in the geology or in the, the spillway design that will control um, the, the back cutting. Uh, that's the time dependent um, piece of this puzzle. And whether we have any opportunities for intervention while the spillway is operational. So this just shows um, in a cartoon fashion the, the, how the erosion would progress back to, to the dam. Um, oops. And then once we get to the weir, um, we ha worry about whether we're going to lose it. So um, we could lose one or more of the structure monoliths either by sliding on the foundation or along a geologic discontinuity like this shown in this yellow, if that wedge were to go, then we would lose our, our control structure. So, um, so that would be uh, lead to our breach. And so that would be our final node, um, which is the breach. And we, that would, how that fails, whether it slides, um, whether it um, slides on a discontinuity, uh, results in uncontrolled release of the reservoir and then potentially continued erosion down to the some base elevation. So that all how that happens um, all contributes to um, the rate and um, consequences. If we if we lose a monolith, that's that could be um, a, a sudden release. That was something um, we were concerned about with Oroville. Um, so how the events happen are um, important for, for the, the time frame for this failure mode. And that this is just a the, the, our um, verbal descriptors. So for each of these nodes, we're, we're gonna be considering, you know, how likely is initiation all the way back to how likely is, is, is this failure at the control structure likely to happen to get to our probability of failure. So this just walks through the failure progression for a, a line spillway shoot. Um, so note that the head cut advance is similar to the unlined case, but we're, what we're doing here is losing um, slabs. So we lose a, uh, a slab for whatever reason water gets underneath, and Dana will talk a little bit about that, can potentially pop off a slab. Um, and then you start getting erosion into the foundation materials and the same thing head cut advances because of these, the back roller and turbulent flow um, and then starts to undermine um, slabs further upstream. Um, but one question when you have a lined spillway chute is whether um, the damaged slabs offer any, any additional resistance even though they're they've been removed, they could provide some armoring. Again, that speaks to how quickly this failure mode advances. Um, so Dana's gonna talk a little bit about this, or quite a bit more about this, so I'll just touch on it. Um, the typical line spillway chute configurations are concrete slabs. Um, they can be independent monoliths or they can be connected with reinforced um, rebar elements. Um, they can be reinforced or not reinforced. They're various thickness, various integrity. Um, they're often included in, in these slabs or are, are passive uh, anchors, which are inset in the concrete with these um, 90 degree, um, 90 degree anchors, um, candy cane or J hooks is what they're called. So they're, I couldn't see it, sorry. There's these foundation anchors. Um, through the slabs and often include um, under drains to help control um, the flow underneath and the water pressure underneath the, the slabs. Um, so this was a question Scott Walker just asked um, that the, the anchors need to be embedded in material that will, oops, uh, that will provide um, sufficient resistance. Um, based on what the, the expected uplift is. So again, we'll do an exercise on that later, thinking about uh, the uplift on, on slabs. Um, so these drains 
Under the slabs can be drilled into rock um, with outlets at the slab surface, or the, the, there can be an under drainage system with gravel trenches or distributed mounds that can, that can protrude into the slab. So this is showing a pipe under drain. Um, so those under drain systems may need to get significant volumes of, wa of water out from under the slab um, and can be under designed if they're not accounted for any cracking or separation in the chute that allows for larger flows to get into the foundation. So those foundation drainage systems have to be pretty well thought through about what actual flows are going to see during spill events. Um, those under drains can plug from sediment clogging or biofouling or mineralization in the materials. Sometimes those pipes can be crushed or broken, um, which allow backfill material into those drainage systems that can clog them. So those are all risk factors you have to think about. How, what do the slabs look like? What do we think the condition of the drains are? What do we think the conditions of the anchors are in order to consider whether the lining is, is uh, going to stay in place during the flow events you're expecting. Um, other defensive measures such as um, uh, key-ins um, can be really important for stopping the slopping or slowing the backward progression of erosion in a spillway chute. So when you're thinking, looking at old design drawings of a, of a structure, look for whether there are any of those defensive measures that could help slow things down or even halt, halt the process during a flow event so that um, once the spill event is complete, you can go in and, and fix things and you haven't lost your spillway or your control, sh control structure in entirety. So again, this is more of um, what the mechanisms that can lead to those slabs um, being lost or popping off. Jane is going to talk about this, hydraulic jacking, delamination, um, and the, the um, what, how, how those... Um, how those effects, the effect of flow can um, remove those slabs uh, from a line spillway chute. Um, water can get under the spill, under the, the slabs because of cracking, because of poor concrete con construction, um, because the drains protrude into the concrete. Um, if there's um, heave or swell of the foundation material or foundation rebound or um, in any other instability in the foundation that um, results in um, displacement of those slabs. Um, so thinking about the line spillway, um, again, thinking through the process of how a line spillway uh, were to fail, we would have loading, spillway over at some volume into this, in this spillway chute. A flaw would exist in the concrete um, such that water gets underneath the slab uh, through, co through concrete cracks or offsets or joints. Um, and then what are the foundation conditions that, lead, that also contribute to the flaw? Um, is there seepage or groundwater that can get through the foundation that can bypass the, the concrete uh, lining, get around a training or over a training wall, and then initiation of loss of a line spillway. So um, if you have those offsets, you can get stagnation pressures that allow the, the slab sections to be um, hydraulically jacked um, and removed from the chute. Um, so in order for that to happen, your reinforcement, your anchoring has to be um, overcome. And those sections have to be able to be removed and transported downstream. Um, so that means your foundation under drain system is overwhelmed. It, it's not operating um, as you expected. So then the process progresses and you get concentrated flow in the chute, um, angry water going down the chute and, and continuing to remove slabs and scour uh, whatever the foundation material is. Um, And then continuation can't intervene, so you're getting continued erosion. Um, you're get, you assume in your event tree that you can intervene. It is hard to intervene in um, spillway chutes while they're spilling. Um, and then eventually you get to the control structure and destabilize the control structure, which leads to 
breach. Um, so your monoliths, uh, you, you may lose one or more monoliths that fall into the scour hole and you get uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So again, these are sort of reiterations. You've got to think about the foundation conditions, um, the deterioration, degra degradation, and erosion uh, that may be happening in the foundation. You may have indicators that you can see, you may not. Um, you have to think about the under drainage system, how it was designed, what it's sized for, can it handle the flows, um, has it been inspected, um, are there any reasons to expect that it would be plugged, um, are there any cracks in your spillway chute, uh, has, have inspections noticed any other defects, um, are the crack, if there are cracks, have they been monitored? Um, where are they in relation to what we know about the foundation? Um, and then also thinking about the evolution, the temporal deterioration of the system. Um, so how a system is in, in one periodic assessment, in the next one, you can't just assume, oh, at the last one it was fine. You gotta think about what, what's changed. Are there new cracks, have uh, new cracks developed, or are the drainage are there any indicators the drainage system aren't wor isn't working as well as it was 10 years ago? Um, anchors, um, w whether there's any uh, development at a plunge pool. Um, yeah, so basically a lot of the stuff I, I talked about before. So if you think about what the geology is, what the, the flow regime is, and, and um, those all contribute to how uh, concrete line spillway can fail. So this is a figure of Oroville. You guys have probably all seen it before. Uh, pretty dramatic uh, incident. And the key vulnerabilities at Oroville were um, a thin concrete chute slab, um, the under drains and anchors, um, there were under drains and anchors, but there were some adverse foundation conditions. Uh, so when the chute slab failed, we got erosion through um, that weaker ge uh, geologic material um, that uh, could that the, the slabs couldn't stay stay anchored. So the uh, erosion continued um, in this manner. So the spillway, this is the spillway chute. Uh, once those slabs failed, we, we got erosion through the, the weaker geology. So another case study is the Paradise Dam spillway. Um, it was a small anchor with an end sill that was compromised. So scour of up to 40 feet occurred uh, near a vertical face at the end sill. So that, that um, defensive measure just didn't quite cut it. Um, so this is similar to the chute slab failure mode with progression affected by the ability for the slab to cantilever um, and local hydraulic characteristics and the geology directly under the slab. So this is um, that vertical um, feature uh, and the, so the shape of the erosion is, is a little bit different but um, the mechanism was the same. So key factors that affect uh, vulnerability. Again, these are things we've talked about before. Um, the soil characteristics, the characteristics of, of what's downstream of the spillway. Is it vegetated? What do we expect the resistance to be based on the, the soil material? The same for rock. This is stuff Adam talked about. We did the exercise on understanding the joint spacing and the rock strength and weathering and whether there are any features in the rock that make it more erosive. And then the, um, for both soil and rock, um, the, any defensive measures that, that are designed in, um, what are the uh, characteristics of the flow? Is there, what are the energy, energy dissipation features? Um, that will affect where the head cut develops and how quickly uh, it progresses upstream. So again, with spatial conditions, you got to think about the spatial extent of geologic features um, because 
you, you know, if you don't have a uniform geology, complex geologic features are going to affect the location and the extent, the width, both the width and the length of how the erosion is going to progress. Um, also, the development of a plunge pool um, will affect the energy um, available from from the flow to keep to um, progress the erosion. So again, this is a, a figure that demonstrates um, how your geology affects uh, your, so your hydrologic uh, loading events uh, affects when the event occurs, but also how your geology affects the, the path uh, of any um, erosion formation. Um, so this is um, and a really important point. So this is um, spillway hydrograph. So what we need to also think about is the availability of the water and the availability of that angry water. Um, so in how, when we think for each of the nodes in, a, in the event tree, where are we in the hydrograph? And that the questions we have to ask are, um, how much flow do we have? And, and for how long, at what point in the erosion process. Um, because if we, obviously, if, if we get initiation, if the flow continues, it will progress. But if, if, we, um, if we are at a point in the hydrograph, the spillway hydrograph, where we stop spilling, well, then erosion will stop at that point. So just because we initiate erosion doesn't mean we're going to get progression all the way back to the control structure because we may, um, the water spilling may stop. That might be um, what helps us with, um, uh, with, before getting to breach. So got to think about the availability of water um, when we're talking about the erosion. So um, we have some uh, tools to um, estimate what the stream power is. This, these are a few examples. Um, this is a physical model that was constructed for Bluestone Dam to understand um, the, uh, the characteristics of the flow uh, downstream to understand the, the erosion cap the erosion, erosion um, capacity for from the flow. Um, we can also do comp complex uh, computation of fluid dynamics, fluid dynamics, CFD models to show us like where the um, where the highest stream power is. So this is a CFD model that shows. Um, where our flow is the most concentrated. And, and the same here, this is a physical model of the Thule River that shows that once this is the, the weir, once the flow came over the weir, we were getting concentrated flow along the abutment. So there are tools to, to help us understand a little bit more uh, where the erosion may happen um, and at what, uh, at what flows. So takeaway points. Um, it's pretty complex, but the flow and scour capabilities or capacities in a spillway requires um, really a lot of a lot of brain power from people who understand the water, the geology, um, the structural uh, components. Uh, so you got to have the right people talking about um, all of these things in the room to, to consider whether um, the uh, spillway is at risk for erosion. And understand um, the temporal changes in risk. Um, a spillway, uh, you know, you might have spill events and you see a little bit of erosion, you don't think it's such a big deal. The next event, like in the case study we saw, you get a little bit more back cutting and at some point it becomes critical and you think, oh, something needs to be done. Um, so it's, you can accept it for, for, for some events, but then at some point, um, the concern for losing the control structure becomes too high. And um, so that's sort of the temporal uh, change in risk. Um, so the case studies shown really illustrate the importance of understanding the geology um, and how that relates to the geotechnical and structural conditions. 
Um, understanding the flow, the stream power, the duration are all important um, parts of understanding if, erosion, if spillway erosion, um, what the risk poses, what this risk of spillway erosion poses. Um, so understanding the flow hydraulics concentrations due to spatial, spatial variations in, in the slope um, also must be considered. So all those, <clears throat> those concepts, um, which including the ones that include models, inform our risk characterization, but there's really quite a bit of judgment um, with spillway erosion failure modes uh, to, under, to, to make judgments about the time components um, and the extent um, of the expected erosion, both vertically and um, horizontally. So uh, pretty complex, um, but uh, no longer in the back seat because um, we've recognized that um, these incidents are um, important and dramatic. So with that, do we have any questions? Questions from now. Come on. Thursday morning. You say considering those screen damage state type risks that they have to their structure about their say go all the way back to the wall and have it completely unreleased to that reservoir. Is that risk and consequence being considered by the core as well? I think the answer is yes. Dana, maybe you can speak to that. You have been involved with the spillway uh, characterization. So I think what he's asking is, um, are we characterizing our portfolio with respect to consequences that are related to loss of the control? Or just Maybe. Extreme damage to the structure, right? It's not life loss at that point in time. It's more economical than structure. So I would say that was something we didn't emphasize much until we saw the development of more of it. We, we always made a conscious effort to take, you know, understanding and understanding the life safety and transfer that for the operations and maintenance programs. Um, since we've probably, probably done a better job trying to find things that result in verificational risk, right? Um, economic risk. Um, the, the challenge, one challenge. Safety programs into operation maintenance programs. Um, we, we end up with those challenges to where we really have to look for low cost remediations. If not, we have to meet an economic justification of BCR01. But yes, we are, we have been focused. Well, maybe some availability bias is, is going away after five years, but um, I think that's, that's the intent, part of the intent of the spillway screen that Manal talked about mm -hmm. is to identify these programmatic things that we, we might find other solutions, other programs to be able to remediate them across our portfolio. And I'll add on to that as part of a risk analysis, we do have economic damages that we account for. So some of those will be some lost benefits, recreational benefits, water supply benefits, but there are also economic losses due to the loss of being able to operate a structure or the cost of rebuilding a structure. So if we have a, a particular damage state, and that's that's something that we've been focusing on a little bit more too when we talk about the end event of an event tree breach or some other damage state, right? Because it could be something like Warville where we don't have a breach, but we've got this dam that's been severely crippled. Um, or yeah, re absolutely. reputation from the public, certainly. And that's that's something that's difficult to difficult to evaluate, right? Really difficult to quantify. But I would also say that lately when we've been looking at prioritizing uh, our inventory or classifying our inventory, particularly from a tolerable risk standpoint, we're starting to look a little bit more at damages or events that cause significant economic impacts. Uh, that's something that we are considering, but again, in the, in the context of life safety being paramount, the game is how much weight, how much emphasis do you put on that for an event that won't result in life loss? So it's still something that we're trying to figure out, but something that we are paying more attention to.
there's a lot of focus on uh, for hydraulic jacking on end of the flow offsets of the slabs. Can you talk about, or do you have any, are there any case histories for end of the flow offsets on the training walls? I might defer that to you, Dana, training well. I am sure there's probably O&M issues that, that we've experienced. I'm not sure there's of a case history yeah. to where that's led to a major incident of significance may be out there. I'm just not familiar with it. Anything else? How common is it to have foundation drains or to not have foundation drains under the slabs in a spillway? I think it's fairly common practice uh, that there are drains, whether they're properly designed, properly maintained, how old they are um, uh, is a different question. But I think they're, I mean, generally they're designed in uh, if they're slabs. If a if a spillway does not have the foundation drains, would that be a consideration when you're assessing the potential failure modes? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Manel.